I'm a search and rescue officer for the U.S. Forest Service. I have some stories to tell. I have a pretty good track record for finding missing people. Most of the time they just wander off the path or slip down a small cliff and they can't find their way back. The majority of them have heard of the old stay where you are thing and they don't wander far. But I've had two cases where that didn't happen. Both bother me a lot and I use them as motivation to search even harder on the missing persons cases I get called on to. The first was a little boy who was out berry picking with his parents. He and his sister were together and both of them went missing around the same time. Their parents lost sight of them for a few seconds and in that time both the kids apparently wandered off. When their parents couldn't find them they called us and we came out to search the area. We found the daughter pretty quickly and when we asked where her brother was, she told us that he had been taken away by the bear man. She said he gave her her berries and told her to stay quiet and that he wanted to play with her brother for a while. The last she saw of her brother, he was riding on the shoulders of the bear man and seemed calm. Of course, our first thought was an abduction, but we never found a trace of another human being in that area. The little girl was also insistent that he wasn't a normal man, but that he was tall and covered in hair, like a bear, and that he had a weird face. We searched that area for weeks, and it was one of the longest calls I've ever been on, but we never found a single trace of that kid. The other was a young woman who was out hiking with her mom and grandpa. According to the mother, her daughter had climbed up a tree to get a better view of the forest, and she had never come back down. They waited at the base of the tree for hours calling her name before they called for help. Again, we searched everywhere and we were never found a trace of her. I have no idea where she could have possibly gone, because neither her mother or grandpa saw her come down. A few times I've been out on my own searching with a canine, and they've tried to lead me straight up cliffs, not hills, not even rock faces, straight sheer cliffs with no possible handholds. It's always baffling, and in those cases, we usually find the person on the other side of the cliff, or miles away from where the canine had led us. I'm sure there's an explanation, but it's sort of strange. One particularly sad case involved the recovery of a body. A nine-year-old girl fell down an embankment and got impaled on a dead tree at the base. It was a complete freak accident, but I'll never forget the sound of her mother when we told her what had happened. She saw the body bag being loaded into the ambulance and she let out the most haunting, heartbroken wail I have ever heard. It was like her whole life was crashing down around her and a part of her had died with her daughter. I heard from another search and rescue officer that she killed herself a few weeks after it happened. She couldn't live with the loss of her daughter. I was teamed up with another search and rescue officer because we had received reports of bears in the area. We were looking for a guy who hadn't come home from a climbing trip when he was supposed to, and we ended up having to do some serious climbing to get where we figured he'd be. We found him trapped in a small crevice with a broken leg. It was not pleasant. He had been there for almost two days, and his leg was very obviously infected. We were able to get him into a chopper and I heard from one of the EMTs that the guy was absolutely inconsolable. He kept talking about how he'd been doing fine and when he'd gone to the top, a um, man had been there. He said the guy had no climbing equipment and he was wearing a parka and ski pants. He walked up to the guy and when the guy turned around, he said he had no face. It was just blank. He freaked out and ended up trying to get off the mountain too fast, which is why he'd fallen. He said he could hear the guy all night climbing down the mountains and letting out these horrible muffled screams. That story bothered the hell out of me, and I'm glad I wasn't there to hear it. One of the scariest things I've ever had happen to me involved the search for a young woman who had gone and separated from her hiking group. We were out until late at night because the dogs had picked up their scent. When we found her, she was curled up under a large rotted log. She was missing her shoes and pack, and she was clearly still in shock. She didn't have any injuries, and we were able to get her a walk with us back to base ops. Along the way, she kept looking behind us and asking us why that big man with black eyes was following us. We couldn't see anyone, so we just wrote it off as a weird symptom of shock. 
But the closer we got to base, the more agitated this woman got. She kept asking me to tell him to stop making faces at her. At one point, she stopped and turned around and started yelling into the forest, saying that she wanted him to leave her alone. She wasn't going to go with him, she said, and she wouldn't give us to him. We finally got her to keep moving, but we started hearing these weird noises coming from all around us. It was almost like coughing, but more rhythmic and deeper. It was almost insect-like. I don't really know how else to describe it. When we were within sight of base ops, the woman turns to me and her eyes were as about as wide as I can imagine a human could open them. She touches my shoulder and says, he says to tell you to speed it up. He doesn't like looking at the scar on your neck. I have a very small scar on the base of my neck, but it's mostly hidden under my collar. I have no idea how this woman saw it. Right after she says it, I hear that weird coughing right in my ear. I just about almost jumped out of my skin. I hustled her to hops, trying not to show how freaked out I was, but I have to say I was really happy when we left the area that night. This is the last one I'll tell, and it's probably the weirdest story I have. Now, I don't know if this is true in every SAR unit, but in mine, it's sort of an unspoken regular thing that we run into. You can try asking about it with other SAR officers, but even if they know what you're talking about, they probably won't say anything about it. We've been told not to talk about it by our superiors, and at this point, we've just gotten so used to it that it doesn't even really seem weird anymore. On just about every case where we're really far into the wilderness, I'm talking about 30 to 40 miles, at some point we'll find a staircase in the middle of the woods. It's almost like if you took a stairs in your house, cut them out, and put them in the forest. I asked about it the first time I saw some, and the other officer just told me not to worry about it, that it was normal. Everyone I asked said the same thing. I wanted to go near them, but I was told very emphatically that I should never go near any of them. I just sort of ignore them now when I run into them because it happens so frequently. I have a lot more stories and I suppose if anyone's interested, I'll tell you some tomorrow. If anyone has any theories about the stairs or if you've seen them too, let me know. So I logged back on tonight and was blown away by the staggering amount of interest it seems to have generated. First off, I'll address a few things that you guys have brought up. There's been an overwhelming amount of people mentioning the similarity between some of my stories and those of David Pauly's. I assure you I'm not trying to rip him off in any way. I've got nothing but respect for the guy. He's actually what inspired me to write this, because I can verify a lot of the things he talks about. We do have a lot of these strange missing person cases, and most of the times, they aren't solved. Either that, or we find them in the places they have no business being. I personally haven't been on many calls like that, but I'll share a few that I've seen, and a story my friend told me that relates to this. There was a lot of feedback about the stairs, so I'll touch on that briefly here, and I'll also I'll include a story. They come in a ver variety of shapes, sizes, styles, and conditions. Some are pretty dilapidated, just ruins, but other are brand new. I saw one set that looked like they came from a lighthouse. They were metal and spiral and almost old fashioned. The stairs don't go up infinitely or farther than I could see, but some sets are taller than other. Like I said before, just imagine the stairs in your house as if someone cut and pasted them in the middle of nowhere. I don't have any pictures and it's never really occurred to me to try again after the first time and I don't really like risking my job over it. And I'll try again in the future, but I can't promise anything. A few people expressed the confusion about the guy who ran into the man with no face. Just to clarify, when the climber ascended and reached the top of this peak, he saw another man in a park and ski pants. This was the man with no face. Sorry about the confusing wording of the story, I'll try to avoid that in the future. Alright, on to new stories. As far as missing persons go, I'd say about half the calls I get are related to that. The other are rescue calls, people who fall down the cliffs and hurt themselves, get injured by fire. Uh, you wouldn't believe how often that happened, mostly drunk kids, get bitten or stung by animals or insects. We're a tight team and we have veterans who are excellent at finding signs of lost people. That what makes these cases where we never find any trace of them so frustrating. 
One in particular was upsetting for all of us because we did find a trace of them, but it just led to more questions than answers. An older man had been hiking alone on a well-established trail, but his wife called to say that he hadn't come home when he should have. Apparently he had a history of seizures, and she was worried that he hadn't taken his medication and had suffered one out on the trail. Before you ask, I have no idea why he thought it was okay to go out alone, or why she just didn't go with him. I don't ask about that kind of thing because past a certain point, it really doesn't matter. Someone is missing and it's my job to find them. We went out in a standard search formation. It wasn't long before one of our vets found signs that the guy had gone off the trail. We grouped up and followed him, spreading out in a fan to make sure we were covering him out as much ground as possible. Suddenly, a call comes over the radio telling us to all head back to the vet's location and we come right away because this usually means the missing person is injured and we need a full team to help get them out safely. We meet back up and the vet is standing at the base of a tree with his hands on the side of his head. I ask my buddy what's going on and he points up into the branches of this tree. I almost couldn't believe what I was seeing, but there's a walking stick dangling from a branch at least 30 feet off the ground. The little strap thing on the handle has been looped around the branch and it's just hanging there. There's no way the guy could have tossed it up that far, and we don't see any other signs that he's still in the area. We call up into the tree, but it's obvious nobody's in it. We're all just sort of left scratching our heads. We keep searching for the guy, but we never find him. We eventually bring our, our canines out, but they lose his scent long before this tree. Eventually, the search is called off because there are other calls we have to attend to, and past a certain point, there's not much we can do. The guy's wife called us every day for months, asking if we'd found her husband, and it was heartbreaking to hear her get more and more hopeless each time. I'm not sure why this car in particular was so upsetting, but I think it was just a sheer improbability of it. That and the questions that were raised, how the hell did this guy's cane end up there? Did someone kill him and toss it up there as a weird trophy? We did our best to find him, but it was almost like a taunt. We still talk about that one from time to time. Missing kids are the most heartbreaking. It doesn't matter what circumstances they go missing under. It's never easy. We always, always dread the ones we find deceased. It's not common, but it does happen. David Paul Leeds talks a lot about kids searching rescue teams finding places it shouldn't be, or couldn't be. I can honestly say I've heard about this kind of thing happening more than I've seen it, but I'll share one of the ones that I think about a lot that I witnessed personally. A mother and her three kids were out for a picnic in an area of the park that has a small lake. One is six, one is five, and the other is about three. She's watching them all really closely and according to her, she never lets them out of her sight at any time. She never saw anyone else in the area either, which is important. She packs their stuff and they start to head back to the parking lot. And now this lake is only about two miles into the woods, it's on a very clearly established trail. It's almost impossible to get laws getting from the parking area to it, unless you're deliberately going off the path like an imbecile. Her kids are walking in front of her when she hears what sounds like someone coming up the path behind her. She turns around and in the four or so seconds she's not looking, her five year old son vanishes. She figures he's stepped off the trail up here or something and she asks her other two where he went. They both tell her that a big man with a scary face came out of the woods next to them, took the kid's hands, and led him into the trees. The two remaining kids don't get upset, and in fact she says later that it seems like they've been drugged. They're sort of spacey and fuzzy, so of course she freaks out, starts looking frantically in the area for her kid, she's screaming his name, and she says at one point that she thinks she heard him answer her. Now obviously she can't go blindly running into the woods, she's got the other two kids. So she calls the police and they send us out immediately. We respond and we start to search for him. Over the course of this search, which spans miles, we never find a single trace of the kid. Canines can't pick up any scent. We don't find any clothing or broken bushes or literally anything that would signify a child being there. Of course, there's suspicion about the mother for a while, but it's pretty clear that she's completely destroyed by the whole thing. We looked for this kid for weeks with a lot of volunteer help, but eventually the search peters out and we have to move on. The volunteers kept searching though and one day we got a call on the radio letting us know that a body has been found and needs to be recovered. 
They tell us the location and none of us can believe it. We figure it has to be a different kid. But we go out there about 15 miles from the site where he vanished and sure enough, we find the body of the kid we've been looking for. I've been trying to figure out how this kid got where he did ever since we found him and I've never come up with an answer. A volunteer just happened to be in the area because he figured he might as well look in places no one else would think to on the off chance the body had been dumped. He comes to the base of a tall, rocky slope and halfway up, he sees something. He looks through his binoculars and sure enough, it's the body of a little boy, stuffed in an opening in the rock. He recognizes the colors of the kid's shirt, so he knows right away that it's the missing boy. That's when he calls it in and we're dispatched. It took us almost an hour to get his body down and none of us could believe what we were seeing. Not only was this kid 15 miles from where he started, there was no possible way he could have gotten off there on his own. The slope is treacherous and it's hard for even us with our gliming gear. A 5 year old boy had no way of getting up there, of if that I'm certain. Not only that, but the kid doesn't have a scratch on him. His shoes are gone, but his feet aren't damaged or dirty. So it wasn't as if an animal dragged him up there. And from what we can tell, he hasn't been dead that long. He'd been out there for almost a month at that point and it looked like he'd been dead for at most a day or two. The whole thing was unbelievably strange and was one of the most disconcerting calls I've ever been on. We found out later that the coroner determined that the kid had died from exposure. He'd frozen to death, probably late at night two days before we found him. There were no suspects and no answers. To the day, it's one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. One of my first jobs as a trainee was a search operation for a 4 year old kid that had gotten separated from its mom. This was one of those cases where we knew we were going to find him because the dogs were on a strong scent trail and we saw clear signs that he was in the area. We ended up finding him in a berry patch about half a mile from where he'd been last seen. Kid wasn't even aware that he wandered that far. One of the vets brought him back, which I was glad for because I'm really not good for with kids. I find it hard to talk to them and keep them company. As my trainer and I are headed back, she decides to take me on a detour to show me one of the hot spots where we tend to find missing people. It's a natural dip in the land near a popular trail and people will usually move downhill because it's easier. We hike out there, it's a few miles away, and we get there in about an hour or so. As we're walking around the area, she's pointing out places she's found people in the past. I see something in the distance. Now, this area we're in is about 8 miles from the main parking area, though there's back roads you can take to get closer if you don't want to hike that far. But we're on state protected land, which means there can't be any kind of commercial residential development out here. The most you ever see is a fire tower or makeshift shelter that homeless people think they can get away with building. But I can see from here that whatever this thing is has straight edges, and if there's one thing you, sh you learn quickly is that Nature really makes straight lines. I point it out, but she doesn't say anything. She just hangs back and lets me wander over and check it out. I get within about 20 feet of it, and all the hair on the back of my neck stands up. It's a staircase. In the middle of the fucking woods. In the proper context, it would literally be the most benign thing ever. It's just a normal staircase with beige carpet. It's about 10 step stalls, but instead of being in the house, where it obviously should be, it's out of here in the middle of the woods. The sides aren't carpeted, obviously, and I can see the wood it's made of. It's almost like a video game glitch where the house has failed to load completely, and the stairs are the only thing visible. I stand there, and it's like my brain is working overtime to try to make sense of what I'm seeing. My trainer comes and stands next to me, and she just stands there casually looking at it as if I'm the least interesting thing in the world. I ask her what the fuck this thing is doing here and she chuckles. Get used to it, rookie. You're gonna see a lot of them. I start to move closer, but she grabs my arm. Hard. I wouldn't do that, she says. Her voice is casual, but her grip is tight. I just stand there looking at her. You're gonna see them all the time, but don't go near them. Don't touch them. Don't go up them. Just ignore them. I start to ask her about it, but something in the way she's looking at me tells me that it's best if we don't. We end up moving on, and the subject doesn't come up again for the rest of my training. She was right though, I'd say about every fifth call I go on I end up running across a set of stairs. Sometimes we are relatively close to the path, maybe within 2 or 3 miles. Sometimes we are 20-30 miles out. 
literally in the middle of nowhere, and I only find them during the broadest search or training weekends. They're usually in good conditions, but sometimes it looks like they've been out there for, for miles. All different kinds, all different sizes. The biggest I ever saw looked like they came out of a turn of the century's mansion, and were at least 10 feet wide with steps leading up at least 15 or 20 feet. Now, I've tried talking about it with people, but they just gave me the same response my trainer did. It's normal. Don't worry about it. They're not a big deal. Don't go close to them or up to them. When trainees ask me about it, I give them the same response. I don't really know what else to tell them. I'm really hoping someday I get a better answer, but it hasn't happened yet. There's another one that was less spooky and more sad. A young man went missing in late in winter and when realistically no one should be going that far out onto the trails. We close a lot of them, but some remain open year round unless there's a shitload of snow. We did an operation for him, but we had about 6 feet of snow on the ground. It was an unusually heavy snow year, and we knew it wasn't likely that we'd find him until spring when the thaw came. Sure enough, when the first big thaw came, a hiker reported a body a little ways off the main trail. We found him at the base of a tree in a pile of smelted snow. I knew right away what had happened, and it scared the living shit out of me. Most of you who ski or snowboard or spend any amount of time on a mountain will probably have guessed it too. When the snow falls, it doesn't collect as thick in the areas beneath the branches. It happens with most fir trees because they have a sort of closed umbrella shape, so what you end up is a space around the base of the tree that's filled with a mixture of loose powdery snow, air, and branches. They're called tree wells. They're not immediately obvious if you don't know what you're looking for. We put up signs in the welcome center, big ones, letting people know how dangerous they are. But every year that we get an unusual amount of snow, at least one person doesn't read them, or doesn't take the warning seriously, and we find out about it in spring. My best guess is that this young man was hiking and got tired, or maybe a cramp from walking in the deep snow. He went to go sit at the base of a tree, not knowing that there was a tree well, and fell in. He got stuck up with his feet up, and the surrounding snow caved in around him. Unable to free himself, he suffocated. It's called snow immersion suffocation, and it doesn't usually happen except in really deep snow. But if you get stuck in a weird position like this guy, even six feet of snow can be lethal. What scared me the most was imagining how he must have struggled. Upside down in the freezing cold, he didn't die quickly. The snow must have formed a dense heavy pile on top of him and it would have been literally impossible to get out. As it got harder to breathe, he would have known what was happening. I can't even imagine what he was thinking in his last moments. A lot of my less outdoorsy friends want to know if I've ever seen the goat man while I've been out on calls. Unfortunately, or I guess fortunately, I've never had anything quite like that happen. I guess the closest was the whole black-eyed man thing, but I didn't see anything. However, there was one call where I had something kind of similar happen, but I'm not sure I'm willing to chalk it up to the goat man. We had gotten a report that an older woman had fainted along one of the trails, and needed assistance getting back down to the main area. We hike up to where she's at, and her husband is just beside himself. He runs, well, I guess more jogs, to us and tells us that he was a little ways off the trails and Looking at something, when his wife starts screaming behind him, he runs back to her and she's passed out on the trail. We get her on a backboard and as we're getting her down to the welcome center, she comes to and starts screaming again. I calm her down and ask her what happened. I can't remember verbatim what she said, but essentially what happened was this. She'd been waiting for her husband when she started hearing this really strange sound. She said it sounded like sort of a cat but it was off somehow, and she couldn't figure out why. She went a little ahead to try and hear it better, and it sounded like it was coming closer. She said the closer it got, the more uneasy she was. Until she finally figured out what was wrong, I do remember the next part. Because it was so weird that I don't think I could ever forget it if I tried. It wasn't a cat, it was a man, saying the word meow over and over, just meow, meow, meow. But it wasn't a man, it couldn't have been, because I've never heard a man make his voice buzz like that. I thought my hearing aid was going out, but it wasn't. 
I adjusted it and it still sounded all buzzy. It was awful. He was coming closer but I couldn't see him and the closer he got the more scared I was. And the last thing I remember was the shape coming out of the trees. I guess that's when I fainted. Now obviously I'm a little perplexed as to why a guy would be out in the fucking woods chanting meow meow at people. So once we get down the mountain I tell my supervisor that I'm gonna go search the area to see if I, if I can find anything. He gives me the go ahead I, and I grab a radio and hike back to where she fainted. I don't see anyone so I keep going about a mile more and when I head back I go off the trail uh, to see if I can figure out where she saw him coming from. It's almost sunset at this point and I don't have any desire to be out at night alone so I just sort of write it off and make a mental note to check it again at tomorrow. But as I'm headed back I start to hear something in the distance. I stop and I call out for anyone in the media area to identify themselves. The sound didn't come closer or get louder, but it sounded exactly like a man saying meow meow in this really odd monotone. As comical as it makes it sound, it was almost like that guy in South Park with the electro larynx, Ned. I go off the trail in the direction I think it's coming from, but I never seem to get closer. It's almost like it's coming from all directions. Eventually it sort of just fades out, and I ended up going back to the welcome center. I didn't get any further reports like that and even though I went back into the area, I never heard that sound again. I suppose it could have been some stupid kid out there fucking with people, but even I admit, it was pretty weird.